I'm Vicki Hosler, one of the Upper School Counselors. We are excited to welcome back in person after a couple of your hiatus. Um, COVID year had to be a hiatus, and last year he had a pretty significant injury and could only join us through Zoom. So we're proud, like, proud and excited to have Glenn from Prevention Solutions, formerly FCD, for those of you who've been in his lab for a while, um, here to talk to us this evening. Um, and then a reminder that March 9th, I believe it is, we are showing the film Light, which is about social media kinds of things. And the title of um, Initiative Center. So that'll be our last event of the year. So have a great time for sure. Um, without further ado, Glenn, over to you. Okay, thank you. Good everyone. Um, my name is Glenn Hall, and tonight I am going to do a presentation for you, uh, and I'm gonna use this PowerPoint, but it's gonna be, I'm gonna to try to streamline it because I'm not a big PowerPoint guy. I'd rather have discussion with you, and, but I am going to uh, share some slides with you. And, and we will be out of here by eight o'clock. Um, we're gonna do a uh, stop at eight, and I will hang out for a little bit if you wanna um, chat with me more in private or whatever, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but my name is Glenn Hall, my students, and I do have a lot of them, call me Mr. G. You may have heard my name come home, um, may or may not, but they do um, call me Mr. G. And um, yeah, I represent uh, Hazelman, Betty Ford Foundation, which is a uh, global nonprofit organization, formerly known as FCD. Raise your hand if you remember FCD. Anybody? No? Oh, wow. Oh God, I'm I know, but that's interesting. Well, we just changed. We, we actually just changed our name several months ago from FCP, which stands for Freedom from Chemical Dependency, to Prevention Solutions, because we are now working under Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. Um, they took us on, and we, um, yeah, we've been doing a lot of interesting things lately. But what I'm gonna do right now is take a few minutes and just share quickly a little overview of the history of the organization, because I think that would be really important for you to understand who's working with your kids, um, who is in the school and what we do. Um, and we're doing a lot of work. As you can see, we, are, uh, we have been around for over 40 years. Uh, we've been into over 70 countries, foreign countries. And so it all started uh, 40 some odd years ago with one gentleman by the name of Don Cutler. And Donald Cutler was a Harvard grad who was highly educated, very successful. But Mr. Cutler had a problem. And uh, that problem he had was really personal. It was alcoholism uh, and it was his alcoholism. And so Don Cutler's drinking um, really started to interfere with uh, his personal life and, and all the things that alcoholism can, can interfere with until one day his wife called him downstairs and said, Don, we've got to talk. And when Don came down, he noticed that his bags were packed. And he also noticed that there was a taxi out front. And his wife said, Don, that taxi can take you to rehab or wherever you want to go, but you can no longer stay here. And um, I share that, that with you because this gentleman, Don Cutler, is the guy who started this amazing organization. He started this organization, he went to rehab, which is a good thing, right? Came out and, uh, oh, by the way, he went to rehab in this country where we didn't have a lot of rehabs. In fact, we didn't even have a lot of good education or understanding of chemical dependency and what it was and, and how to deal with it. And, uh, and we're still struggling as a country to really figure out how to slow things down when it comes to chemical dependency, drug addiction. As you all should know, we have major issues around drug addiction in the United States. Uh, but I don't just work here, I work all over the world. And tonight I'll share a lot of information with you around this subject, trends, and things that we have noticed as an organization. I'm a senior specialist. I've been around for a long time. I, I actually started uh, this work 27 years ago. Uh, first of all, let me tell you about the Don Cutler was a character. I actually met him before he passed on, um, but I'll share with you how far 45 years ago was in this country. Uh, Don Cutler, for the first time, walked into a school, sat on the end of a desk in a classroom, uh, puffing on a cigarette, <laughs> talking to kids about his chemical dependency, all right? And um, 
it was so powerful. And I'm talking about his connection to the students that it was a request that you know he fulfilled because he kept doing it and then he started noticing there was a demand and he actually started to hire some people. And uh, that was 45 years ago. Of course, 27 years ago, here comes Mr. G, right? Um, I actually met Don Cover uh, in his office in Massachusetts. I live in Boston, by the way. I flew here um, from Boston uh, Sunday night. I'm leaving Friday to head back for my next assignment. Uh, Don Cutler looks at me 27 years ago and he asked me a simple question. He said, I, I see you're interested in a job. And I said, of course, yes, I'm one here. And he said, looked at me, he says, well, are you in recovery? And I said, yes. And he says, good, because I'm only hiring people who are recovering from chemical dependency. And uh, I thought about that for a moment, right? This is interesting, right? Because the only job that I know, you have to like use drugs to get and, and it, it's, 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 it's interesting, right, because when I looked at Don, you know, he looked good, you know, and um, he struggled. He struggled with alcoholism for so long, but when I met him, it was a long-term healthy recovery. When I met him, I had two years away from my last drug use, and um, he, he was so interested in me at that point. He wanted to know what drug I got addicted to. He said, he said so what drug did you get addicted to? I said, sir, I was addicted. Five. I don't think he ever met anybody quite like me at that point. He did have several people working with him, but um, I had five drugs of choice and he wanted to know more. He wanted to know my story and I shared it with him. And after that, he hired me. Um, and my five drugs of choice, if you're curious, is nicotine, marijuana, alcohol, cocaine, and heroin. I'm an opioid addict as well. Um, and if you're doing the math, yes, I'm 29 years of recovery. Um, coming up on 30 years, I'm excited about that because of the um, Sadly, though, I, I, this year I lost two family members to the opioid crisis that you all, I, I'm sure you know, hearing about it. Um, one of my brothers, I have, I, I, my whole family, by the way, has a disease of addiction. So it runs in families like crazy. I call it a family disease, and that's, that's what it is. Um, but earlier this year, my, my brother, one of my brothers overdosed on fentanyl, and if that wasn't enough, um, and several months later, his son, my nephew, he overdosed and died too. So it was devastating to my family. And, you know, I, I, was, I was sharing some of this with the students, and I was talking to them about, you know, it's so easy to get addicted to drugs, right? The hard part is like, not, not stopping, I told them this today. I had no problem stopping. I could stop with no problem. The problem is to stay stuck and keep that recovery and that sobriety stringing along. My nephew and my brother um, tried numerous times to get recovered. They, get, they, were, they were attracted to my recovery. And I'm, I was like, here I am. You know, I'll do anything for you, but I can't, I can't stay sober and I can't, can't stay clean for you. But I'll give you some direction, and I did. Um, but it just really opened up my eyes even more to the fact that I'm so blessed to be still clean and still in recovery. Um, you know, so tonight, what I want to do is I want to tell you a little bit more about what's going on in terms of the kids, what the classroom looks like. I'm working with ninth graders here on this campus. I'm, I'm also working with little people on what. What campus would we call that? Your campus. Dorothy. Yeah. So, and I and I've been doing this for like several years now. So my routine is I get up having a hotel. And by the way, the hotel is nice this year. It's right. Not that it wasn't nice before, <laughs> but you know what? That's kind of interesting. The hotel they put me in. There's like about ten hotels in that one area. Like, well, I don't know why they do things like that. That's like ten. They're all in the one area. But anyway, you put me in a nice hotel. So my routine, I run over to Dorothy. I see the little people. Oh my goodness. They're, they're fifth graders, right? They are so cute, but they have no filters. <laughs> you, you know, I when I tell you that, they'll tell you some they actually tell me things about you, about you <laughs> that I don't want to hear. I don't, I don't want to hear that. Um, you don't really have to worry so much about that with the high school. They're more guarded and you know, um, but but it's a it's an interesting um 
schedule. So I work with the fifth graders, then I come over here and I've got a, I've got two groups of um, ninth graders, which are, I love working with them and also seventh. So I've got a wide range of, of ages and, and development here that I'm working with. We have, by the way, three curriculums. Um, as an organization, we develop three curriculums. One is lower school, which is designed specifically for those little people. Um, we don't talk about drugs too much at that level. I don't even think they know I'm a heroin addict. I don't even think I mentioned that. I did tell them I smoked, but I didn't even tell them what I smoked. They, and it's funny, your group didn't ask, but this, this group did. They wanted to, was it pot? Is it marijuana? And I'm, so I, I didn't know if they were going to ask, but they, one group did ask. Um, so that lower school curriculum is a, play, a good place to start to like start to put some of the pieces to the puzzle together, which is really interesting, right? Because that age, some of them have, they're like little deers in the head, like they have no idea what I'm talking about. Then there's a few of them in there that have a little bit more information, right? And in a moment, I'm gonna show you a slide on the uh, social norms approach. Because I think this is the, correct me if I'm wrong, did I do social norms before? It was the first year, I tried it. The little people and I don't usually do it with that level I'll explain to you what it, it's a teaching that reveals what they think is going on in the world versus what's really going on and their false perceptions can be interesting and I'll share some of that with you tonight and of course we have the middle school curriculum which is it's, it's designed to go up a notch and um, it's basic prevention education for that level to prepare them for when they get to the high school level. And the high school level curriculum is much more advanced. And we also shift our approach. Like the middle school approach is more me feeding them the basics of this subject. And then when we get to the high school, uh, because they are so much more guarded, I really want to like kind of draw out of them what they, where they're at, what they're doing, what they think and start some dialogues because I want to build a trustful relationship because I'm, I've worked with them year after year and I really want them to feel comfortable enough with me to seek me out if they need some help or just ask really good questions in the classroom. By the way, the teachers that normally are with them uh, throughout the day, every day, are not in the classroom. And we ask them to respectfully remove yourselves from the classroom so the students can feel as comfortable as possible to ask any question um, that they, they feel that they want to ask. And, um, and what's interesting is they do ask some really interesting questions. And I don't judge them or look at them in, in, in any weird way because, you know, kids are just curious. They want to know, you know, what does it feel like to get high? What, you know, all these different interesting questions. Um, so I'm going to try to go through this really, not too quick, but just enough where we can get a, good understanding of what's going on with us as an organization. So prevention solutions, our prevention approach is to empower and, and the process that promotes individuals and families and communities um, with health throughout life. And this is, we're talking about um, really keeping an eye on, on young people and keeping them at a healthy point. Because when we meet students, and I really want you parents to hear this tonight, it's a really important message. Most students are healthy when we meet them. Most students, when we meet them, we meet them at a very healthy place. Are there some students who are playing some games? Of course. And so that's what we try to identify and strengthen their protective factors, which by the way, every school has already in place protective factors. They have counseling departments and they have you know, a lot of adults in the, in the school who are invested in their future and their well-being. And then, of course, then we look at identifying um, uh, and addressing risk factors that contribute to this chemical dependency. And the final one is to intervene on, on, on the actual behaviors that lead to the illness, the disease of addiction. And I, see, I did say disease because we recognize drug addiction as a disease. In fact, um, the definition we use is the compulsive compulsive repetitive use of a drug despite the negative consequences. And, you know, a lot of times kids don't understand what does addiction look like? And like, can it happen if you just try it once? 
And who's at, are there some people more at risk? And the answer is yes, of course, there are some people who are more at risk to get chemically dependent. And uh, you're looking at one, because and mainly because of my genetics, but it's not just genetics, it's also the age I started. In fact, let's take a look at, we're gonna come back to this slide in a moment. I wanna go to this one first. Risk factors associated with chemical dependency, family, age, cravings, tolerance, surrounding. Family is huge. I talked about that a moment ago. Genetics, predisposition. Interestingly enough, I, I grew up in the 70s. I'm 65, I'll be 65 in a couple of weeks. So I'm an old school guy, right? I had no idea that I had alcoholism, drug addiction in my family growing up. Anybody want to take a guess why? How come I didn't know? They, they, didn't, they didn't talk about it. Why? Why did they? How come they didn't talk about it? Shame. Nope. It wasn't no shame. It was just normalized. It was normalized. It was normalized. It was so normalized. And for some reason, my family mastered the ability to become functional alcoholics. Y'all know what I'm talking about? A functional alcoholic will fool the heck out of a young person. And I, I say this, and I share this with my students because I want them to know how did I get addicted to drugs? Like, what happened? And I, I go far, as far back as when I was about this big. And I remember I had four uncles, right? Every one of them were alcoholics. My dad was an alcoholic. All my cousins, brothers, right? And boy, did they look like they were having what? They, they made it look so, so, it was like, to me, I can't wait because I want to have fun too. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to share this part with you. There was one family member that didn't look like he was having fun, okay? And I remember him very clearly. His name was Uncle Ralph, all right? You got to remember, oh, by the way, I'm an identical twin. My brother and I look exactly alike, except I look better. <laughs> my, brother, my brother and I would be, with this big, we hear the doorbell ring, right? Ooh, somebody's at the door. Right, we run to the door and the door opens. My mother answers the door, and there's Uncle Ralph standing in the doorway. Right, I remember like blurting out, You know, when you're that little, you don't you say anything, right? Oh, he smells. And my mother looks at me, she goes, Shut up, don't say that. And then I look at my brother and I go, You know, and we're running in the back room because why are we, we don't want to be out. Uncle Ralph's here. Whenever Uncle Ralph is here, we just don't want to be, there's something wrong with him, right? Nobody told me what was wrong with him, right? And I, I don't know if you want to say shame or whatever the case may be, but I didn't find out that Uncle Ralph was an alcoholic who was homeless in Boston, right? He had no place to go. He showed up at my mother's house every six months. And when I, when, after I got older, I got into recovery and I started looking at my whole family, my picture. I, I started realizing that, right? As a kid growing up, I definitely don't want to be like Uncle Ralph, but I, I would love to be like Uncle Walter, Uncle Raymond, and Uncle Warren from Cape, you don't know Cape Cod, right? He has got two beautiful homes on Cape Cod, nice job and money, and they, and, but they were all alcoholics. And sadly enough, they all died the same way. Okay? They all drank themselves to death. And so that was one of the family pieces that really kind of just pulled me in. The other piece, is this one here, age. That's just, and by the way, this is what I'm kind of weaving into this presentation is up to date scientific research that we have available today that we didn't have just like 20 years ago. Y'all follow me? Because I've been doing this work since, well, since 95, 27 years, right? Don Cutler said, go out there, do your thing. And I watched the organization just really evolve into a place where Hazelwood said, we want you, right? They want, they, hey, I don't, are you all familiar with Hazelwood Betty Ford Foundation? They are the leading organization in this country for rehab treatment, all right? Pricey, but it's it's a place that's got it going on. I'm talking about all kinds, out in Minnesota, all right? The one piece they did not have under their belt was prevention. And they knew what we were doing. We were, we, we, we're advancing, we're doing research, 
and we're applying all of this into our classroom, into our parent meetings, into our all, all sorts of services that we have available for schools like this. So when I, as, as, as I'm going through, as I'm going through this presentation, I'm thinking about, okay, so now here I am, I'm, um, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought because I'm, I've been up since early as well. Age. Yeah. That, oh, so 13, and you know, she's not here now. There's a counselor who I work with on this side with the seventh grade. I said, oh, is this you? Is that you? No, I wish she was here. Because her and I, right, we've been really talking a lot about the, um, just the way the kids are behaving and how they're really paying attention and whatnot, but they're also, these are, you, you stand in front of a classroom full of young people, you don't know what's going on in their personal lives. You know what I mean? They look good, they, they're jumping around and up, but some of those kids are affected in such a way by the subject that they are, some of, them, some of them don't want to sit still. Some of them won't, they want to ask certain questions. And one of the one of the young students was um, talking about. Oh, I brought up the age of thirteen. I started at thirteen, right? And I also mentioned to the seventh graders. Um, first, I said, "Who's thirteen? And of course, almost every hand went up. And I said, "Do you realize that I was thirteen years old when I tried my first drug?" And that in this country, the average age to try a drug for the first time is about 13. So evidently, this what I said triggered this young girl who didn't feel comfortable sitting in the room. I don't know what that's really all about, but I, of course, respect that. And I talked to the counselors about it. And um, she came back the next, she came back today, and she was like all over me, you know, talking, you know, she wanted to get involved and stuff. And I actually had a conversation with her to you know, ask her what you know, is there anything I can do or change or anything like that? But she seems to be okay. But that age is fascinating. Okay, it is you know, and I'll tell you why it's so interesting to me. I started doing this work um, twenty seven years ago, but at that same time, I got an offer to work in rehab treatment with adults, and I and I did that. So I had two jobs going at the same time. I became a, a substance abuse counselor for adults. And almost every adult that I've sat down with, I'm talking about heroin addicts, crystal meth addicts, alcoholics, right? And, and these are adults who are like in their 40s, maybe 50s. When, what age were you when you first started? It is amazing. Almost everyone will say 13, around 13 years old. And also, there's another interesting piece. What drug do you think they started with? Take a guess. Alcohol or marijuana, and then one more, nicotine, right? And you know what kids ask me, like all the time? I don't know why, but they do. Mr. G, what's the worst drug? <laughs> and they look, I don't know what they're looking for when they ask that question. Like, I don't know if they're looking for me to co-sign something, right? You know, <laughs> like, what's the worst drug? And you know, you know how I answer that question? The worst drug is the one that you think is the safest. Mm -hmm. I thought marijuana was so safe, right? Because I, you know, I never saw anybody die, right? I never saw anybody vomiting, crashing cars and stuff. I just, that drug to me seemed like acceptable. You know what I mean? I got news for you. Out of the five drugs I got addicted to, marijuana did the most damage. And I'm talking about severe damage. Anybody want to take a guess at what damage I'm talking about? Relationships? Sort of. With who? Oh, I love you. You're coming with some good stuff here. Keep going. <laughs> Are you talking about development? Because that's really what it is. Relationship with myself. I arrested my development at 13 and didn't even know it. And I stayed 13 for 22 years. I smoked so much marijuana as a teenager, I forgot to grow up. And now I'm an expert on the subject. I've done my homework. Because you got to know that there's going to be kids that are reading 
and they're doing some like research themselves. And so they're going to want to challenge. They don't mess with me today. Back in the day, they used to mess with me, but I don't know what it is. I don't know about my person. I think it's that deep voice. I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> that, that, that really messed with me. Right? But like today, I had some 11th graders and I did a one shot presentation for, for the juniors, right? And one kid in there asked me about my opinion about the legalization of marijuana. And, it, and listen, I do this all the time. So I'm going, he's way over, like on the back wall of the room. And just the way he asked on his body language and everything, I could tell, right, if we had more time, him and I would have been going at it for a little bit, you know. But it was a quick presentation. And, and I don't get it all the time, but I do get kids who want to push back on the idea that they shouldn't put drugs in their body, right? Um, I used to get that a lot back in the day. I don't get it so much now. There's a reason why I believe teenagers are not pushing back so much on, well, isn't it all right to try a little bit? Um, what about if we use it in moderation, right? That, I used to hear that. Can you all guess the reason, the number one reason why teenagers don't fight back that much today? There's, there's, a, there's something in prevention education that is resonating and it's starting to make sense to them and they're starting to respect it. And it's what I just talked about a second ago. That's a hint. Arrested development. It, it's it's brain development. That it, listen, twenty something years, 22, 23 years ago, if I said to a kid in a room, "Why is it we're asking you to wait?" They, before they would say brain development, they would come up with, "Well, that's the problem. The United States has got it backwards, right?" Because and I, we work overseas. I work in Europe. I work all over the world. We should be following the European approach because they those kids over there know how to drink. We don't know how to drink, Mr. G, right? In this country, our kids are just simply out of control, binge drinking, it's just a mess, right? And I heard that, right? And back in the day, I, I really couldn't argue with much because we didn't have all the, you know, the, the research to back it up. Today, oh, I love it. They come up with that, <laughs> man, I'm, we, okay. They don't have Irish cousins. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, the, the actual truth is, um, FCD, old FCD, Prevention Solutions. We actually found out some really interesting things about that. The one thing we found out that the country that has the, the least amount of misuse of alcohol amongst teenagers is the United States, all right? That contradicts what people have been thinking for so many years, right? In fact, we're the second lowest country in the world when it comes to teenagers misusing alcohol. Did y'all know that? Yeah. And, and listen, you, you're, you're adults. So you come from the place where you might remember them talking about how we binge drink too much. We drinking and driving and kids are dying on. Listen, we've done so much work over these last couple of decades. Right now, our, every year, our drinking has been going down. And Iceland, if you're curious, who is the number one? It's Iceland, right? Guess who has the highest misuse of alcohol in the world? And it's not just one place, it's a bunch of places. Yeah. It's European countries. Do you know why? They start the drinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's it right there. The younger you start drinking, the greater your chances of developing alcoholism and chemical dependency, right? In fact, a teenager who drinks, even if it's supervised by a parent, is five to seven times more likely to end up with alcohol or drug problem later on in life, right? And here I am in the US, and I still, in 2023, have parents who disagree with the idea that we should not allow our teenagers to drink until their brain is fully developed. No, I don't buy that one. Because if we don't teach them how to drink now, they're gonna go nuts when they get to college. Raise your hand if you ever heard that one before. Yeah. Um, and by the way, right, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, right, because the parents that I need to really talk to, they are, are not here. coming here. <laughs> they are not coming out to this presentation. But listen, when you, when you serve alcohol to teenagers with the understanding or belief that you're going to teach them how to, to, like, drink more responsibly later, 
there's no we look for, there's no research that says that's accurate right the research says if you delay use each year each year that goes by right the chances of developing chemical dependency keeps going down because what's happening is the frontal lobe is is structuring and formulating to become mature enough to satisfy i'm a parent I want to be satisfied when my son goes to college. And I mean, I'm not going to be 100% satisfied because I'm still going to worry, but I, I don't want to worry so much because of his behaviors that he's been like perpetuating and building on over the high school years. Those kids who drink the most in college, by the way, they started in high school, just so you know, right? They didn't wait. Those are the ones who were drinking the most, the ones who we found out doing the best at the freshman level are the ones who entered that place with a strong frontal lobe that's preventing them from misusing anything, not just out anything. So that's interesting in itself. Go back to this social norms. This one is really powerful. It is my favorite part of prevention. It is a strategy that um, we're using in all sorts of areas of prevention. We're using it in our surveys. We're using it in the classroom, the ISE, the intensive student education. We're using it for transition to college presentations for, for, for our seniors. We're using it in parent meetings and in faculty meetings. What is a social norm? A social norm is a behavior that's accepted in a society. We don't think twice about it. It is accepted. And what's fascinating about social norms is if you leave this country and go somewhere else on the other side of the world, that social norm could shift. And so social norms in themselves are really interesting. Over here, we have normative beliefs. They're different. A normative belief is an individual's thought on something they think is accurate, but don't have any real solid evidence to back it up. And when we do this work in the classroom, our goal is to find out what kids are thinking, right? And, and then help them recognize their thinking is not accurate, if it's not accurate. Some of the, sometimes their thinking is pretty close, right? I have to be honest with you. So here's how I would do it. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna take you through a whole class of this. I'm just gonna give you an idea what it looks like in the classroom. In the classroom, I will pass out papers, all right? Or have them get on their phones. And something that they can document two percentage numbers privately where no one else can see those numbers in the classroom. And I'll ask them two simple questions. I did it already, by the way, today. Um, I did it with the, the, the little people, but I also, I, I did it with um, fourth grade. I think it might have been seventh grade. I know I have some more work. I have more work to do tomorrow. So here's the question, right? And, and by the way, I'll act like, you can act like students for a minute because the question I ask you, I want you to keep a percentage number in your head. Okay, here we go. In the United States, what percentage of high school students do you think are in the category of higher risk alcohol drinkers. They're in high school, right? They're in the US. A typical, any typical high school, what percentage of high school students do you think drink alcohol recreationally with their friends? I'm talking about anywhere from senior all the way down to freshman year. Put that number in your head. Y'all got a number? Are you, are you having a hard time? Wait, the first one is what percentage is in the category of high risk? And then the second one, what percentage? I didn't get to the second one. Oh, okay. And, and that's all right, because I want to be clear on the first one, okay? Because once I'm clear on the first one, you'll, be, you'll know the second one. A higher risk drinker is somebody who is binge drinking, misusing alcohol. And, and by the way, typically when teenagers drink, they typically drink too much, right? All right. So that's the first question. Get that number in your head. It's a percentage number. That, it's your percentage number. By the way, can you imagine this? I'm doing this with kids now, all right? So... These are seventh graders anticipating to go to high school, right? And then ninth graders are anticipating to go where? To college. So each group, as they're anticipating to go somewhere, they haven't been there yet, but they have an idea what it might look like. So when it comes to drug use, right, I'm asking them, what percentage of high school students do you think are in the category of higher risk alcohol drinkers? They write their number down, okay? Then I say, okay, this, here's the second question. What percentage of college students in the United States do you think are in the category of higher risk alcohol drinkers? So ultimately right now, 
they'll have two percentage numbers in their head. Ultimately, right now, I would guess that all of you have two percentage numbers in your head. So before I tell you what the students said, I want to see what you guys are thinking. All right. So raise your hand if you have a number in your head for high school. What is it? 50. 50. Oh, by the way, don't change your number if it's dramatically different. <laughs> you're playing it safe, though. I know you're playing it safe. She's right in the middle, right? But what is yours? Fighting with myself. So I'm going to say 40. Okay. 80. Anybody else? 20. 40. 25. 20. Okay. Let's go to college. By the way, do you think the number's going to go up or down? Okay. This is interesting, God. I asked the kids the same thing. Some of them said, no, two girls said, no, it's going down. And she had, and she actually she actually had a pretty good reason for saying it. And you know, I, I, I quickly tell you, she said she was like, well, they're more mature up here and they're gonna have, you know, which yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was a seventh grade. All right, you ready? College. Ready? Who's got a number? Go. 75%. 60. 60. 80, 35, 80, 80 another 80, 40, 40, 40. Okay. Listen, when I did this with the students, the numbers were like way up here. And and it's interesting, right? I'm talking about in the stratosphere. Like, and, and sometimes they're so goofy because they're like immature at the seventh grade level. When they say things, I'm not sure if they're like being, being goofy or being serious, right? Because Two said just today, a hundred percent. And and you know sometimes I think they're just trying to get a rise. You know, and, you know I said so. I said, Wait, are you kidding? No, Mr. G. Everybody gets drunk in college, right? So I don't want to goof around and laugh with because this is what he believes, right? Right. And um, when you have that kind of when you have that kind of false perception in their minds, what it's doing is it's presenting. A, a, a state of mind that we call anticipatory socialization. So they're basically thinking, well, I, I've got to, I got to, you know, get myself ready for this place. That place doesn't even exist because I'll, I'll tell you, raise your hand if you're curious what the real numbers are. Yeah, I would be too. Right? <laughs> Listen, the University of Michigan, by the way, you can do your own research. It's um, University of Michigan has a program called Monitoring the Future. They do a lot of studies in the United States and they're so scientific and so spot on that we're, we're amazed at the work that they do. So we kind of rely on some of their work. We, we do our own work as well as an organization. We do our own surveys. But in, and I'm going to use the year 2019. Why do you think I'm going to 2019? Right before the pandemic, because those pandemic years, if they, you just hard, it's hard to leave. It, those numbers were well, anyway. So 2019, right? In the U.S., around 20 percent of high school students were in the category of high risk alcohol drinkers. 20 percent. And that same year, 2019, it jumped up to about 33 percent for college. Okay, so both high school and college. It's interesting, right? Both high school and college. The, it's the minority of individuals that are making poor choices. And why is it that we, that the kids and sometimes parents, right, think it's higher? Why? Does anybody want to take guess why? Why do you think that? What makes you think that? I think with frat houses, yeah. you hear about these horrific, you know, alcohol poisoning, and so you, I just extrapolate, like, oh my God, they're already high. <laughs> Right. No, it's true. I think it's what you pay attention to. They're having fun. They're at a party. They're doing this. And that. We just don't really pay attention when they're all also in the library studying or gotcha. on the computer. Perfect. You said because you you reminded me, but you just cleaned it up because we don't pay attention to that. And my job, and my job for one as a specialist in this field, is to celebrate the individuals for working hard to make good choices. That's why we're, we're, we're starting, I'm going to West Virginia um, soon. We're starting huge programs down there called Salsa. Are you, um, I don't know if you guys, they, these, are, these are students advocating life without substance abuse. And it's peer leadership groups that give the voice to the individuals who are 
who are really working hard to not use chemicals and have no problem expressing that, you know, and like I'm talking about like high school students who will put on skits and go down to middle school and, and do a presentation for the middle school students to help them understand not everybody's smoking weed, not everybody's vaping, and I'm here to tell you I'm one. You know, that that's kind of stuff is really so we're working on that as an organization to get these schools to jump on board. I'll talk more about that at the end of the week with this school, because we could probably do something like that here. But here's the, here's the key, right? My students had high numbers, all right? And their numbers, I gotta bring them down. I have to tell them, listen, bring your numbers down. Because otherwise, and, and here's the thing, I process this at the end of the class. I process it with them individually. I tell them, go around the room, give me something in your life that influences you to believe that drug use is so high, that you think it's so high, over 50%. And they slowly start to come out. They say, social media, that's, by the way, that's a huge one, right? Do you know what your kids are looking at on social media? Are you monitoring all the sites that they're, you know, they're going to? Uh, here's another one, movies, right? TV shows. You know, the TV show, I, I, I'm reluctant to say this in the classroom because I don't want to give them ideas unless they tell me. I would rather them tell me first because the last five schools that I've been at, and you got to remember, every week I'm in a different school. There's a TV show that kids in different schools have been telling me about in the last few months. Um, it's called Euphoria. Well, raise your hand if, you, if you've ever seen Euphoria. You've heard of it or seen it. It is, I've never seen it, but it's graphic. I understand in, in with drug references. And it actually, even one parent said, yeah, they glorify it. They make it seem like, you know, glorified to, to some degree. If kids are watching that, you've got to know that's putting a stamp on their brain without their permission. It's not just that. Some, a lot of these kids have, they got siblings in college. They're listening to some of this stuff. They got siblings in high school. So all of this is a is a is a teaching that I love the work because when I leave, this is one thing you can look at, walk away from the school. And the reason why I chose to do this with the um, with the fifth graders this time because I because I'm so consistent with the school, they keep calling me back. <laughs> I would love to see those fifth graders when they reach the seventh grade. And when I do that teaching again, to see if it resonated and help if they held on to it. Do you know what I mean? That's why I'm still, I'm trying to start a little bit younger. It's not in the curriculum, but I was specialist. I made that executive decision to live there. Because I want I want them to, I want them to come to the seventh grade even healthier than any other group that's come to that grade before them. All, all, we already talked about this brain development, delay use, it's a, crit it's a critical detection on the frontal lobe. We know that the frontal lobe of the brain does not fully develop until about 25 years old. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did. And uh, if it's not appropriate at this time, to stand up. But you had spoken and you had said um, that you know, kind of the approach of educating your child on how to drink appropriately. Right. Uh, uh, versus kind of um, an abstinence approach. Like don't don't drink it all. Like it's not good for you or don't smoke pot. Don't right. drink. The part of the philosophy that I think I have is the concern that if you prohibit that they're still gonna do it. And if they're doing it and it's not in kind of a supervised way, if they're doing it and they may potentially be driving you know, and not teaching them things like, hey, if you're going to drink something, you can't drop it. And that's got to be an absolute rule. And some of these things on uh, managing quantities, things like that. So how do you, do you, do you preach kind of abstinence? Uh, do you preach that parents just say, no, don't do this, your brain's developing, don't do it, and if you do it, you're in big trouble. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I don't preach to them. I'm not. Well, I know, I'm no, I know what you're saying. Wrong, I, I, I'm being a wise guy. Teach. <laughs> yeah, good teach. You know, sir, um, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking what popped in my mind was a term harm reduction. And 
it's it's actually a, a really it's not new but it's to, it's becoming very popular now in education um, prevention education and substance misuse harm reduction and it's all is basically explaining to young people if if you get in a situation where you made a, a bad choice here's a way out or here's what i think you should do um i still believe that our message is your brain is under construction and for you to put alcohol in your brain or any drug in your brain during these development stages it is too risky and i also i'm going against by the way what uh, what people have been saying for years people say well they're going to do it anyway by the way by the way this is kind of what i'm that's right well they're going to do it anyway do you realize when when, when students when young people keep hearing that what do you think that does so they're going to do it anyway we, we you, what we're trying to shift is a culture we're trying to shift it to a place where it's expected that they don't put chemicals in their body while they develop it if we don't shift from that we're not gonna it we won't we won't get to a place where i want my kids to my sons by the way and, and i'm different because when i say different i have obviously i'm an alcoholic i'm a drug addict so my talk is maybe a little bit different than say some other parents but i still would appreciate if you would say listen i expect you not to drink alcohol while your brain is under construction it's developing why dad why mom what about my friends listen i i would prefer you not to that's my expectation do you know what i found out doing this work the last thing a young person wants to do and they won't tell you this because you're so consumed with raising them I know I can raise two boys, they slam doors and they tell you, you're ruining my life, why can't I go and this and that? The last thing they want to do is disappoint you. They do not want to disappoint you. So they share that with me and they'll tell me stuff that they may not share with you unless you have that ultimate relationship. But, and, and here's another thing too, I want everyone to understand something. I'm just giving you the research, all right? As a specialist that works with this organization, none of us are going to tell you how to raise your kids. If you think it's a good idea to like supervise your kids with beer or wine or whatever, that's your thing, right? But we're telling you that that's not a good idea, not in 2023. And by the way, some of those ideas are way outdated now. They're outdated, they're old school, and they simply don't work. That's why the European countries, right? We're we're monitoring all this. They go. They're raising their drinking age back up. Did you know that? See, the, see. I work in the Netherlands. I work in Amsterdam. I work all over the world. And it was really interesting. I would fly over there, and the kids, right? They found it necessary to pull me aside and tell me how much misuse is going on. And and that was something they thought they didn't think I knew, which I really didn't know to that extent. Do you know what I mean? I'm talking about high school students who are, Mr. G, can I tell you something from this one? And, and they're like, well, we could drink at 16 over here, right? We, they have pubs that are just for 16 year olds to go order after school beer and wine. And, um, and the students who shared this with me, and it, of course it's cultural, right? That's an, it's embedded in their culture, right? And they frown upon anybody who's misusing alcohol, but they forgot about this one. You're talking about a brain that is undeveloped, immature, and has no breaks, none. And and you and putting alcohol in their body before it's developed is not going to give them breaks. In fact, you know what these students remind me of? Little Ferraris, brand new fast cars with no breaks. When will they get their breaks? It, it's close to 21. You know what? And I'll say this just to help anybody understand. I would much rather see a 19 year old, 18 or 19 year old, start to dibble and dabble with alcohol than a 13 or 14 year old, all right? When we set the age at 21, who do you think starts drinking? Not all the time, but what, what age do you think starts to put it, put it to their lips? What age? If it's set at 21, around 19, right? If you set it at 18, who's, what age do you put it at your lips? Around that 16. 
You come down a little further, 16. So, so what we're trying to do, again, we're trying to shift the culture and just help people become educated enough to understand they're not missing anything. Alcohol's not going anywhere. It'll be there. And, 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 and here's the other thing, right? We're not just talking about alcohol, right? right? We're talking about vaping. We're talking about marijuana, right? Look at this here. Nicotine. I'm going to do this fast because I want, I want to get this out of the way, but I want, I want everyone to get a good understanding of what this stuff is about. Vaping has turned things around dramatically in about seven years in our country. For 20 some odd years, nicotine addiction through smoking has every year has been going down, 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 right? Out of the five drugs I got addicted to, the hardest one for me to quit, not the one that did the most damage, that was marijuana, the hardest drug for me to separate from, to get it out of my mind psychologically, physiologically, was nicotine by far. And I'm a heroin addict who had, I curled up in a fetal position, vomiting, diarrhea, cold chills for 14 days straight in a detox. Doesn't even come close to the madness that I went through to get away from smoking. I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for 20 something years. And yes, you feel it? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the, the unbelievable like craving that came out of nowhere, right? Was the heroin anything, right? So I can speak that. The, look at this. Here. Any of these look familiar? This looks familiar, right? What is that? I, interesting enough, there's no, this, there's a battery in here. There's a microprocessor in here. There's a, there is, none of these things burn. Every one of them, there's no fire here, right? These are all electronic nicotine delivery systems. They were created 11 years ago in China. This one right here was the first one that was created. That one right there. That's called the e-cigarette. That, that replica of a cigarette never got popular in the United States for one main reason. People in this country don't want to even look like they're smoking anymore. It's not cool. It's not healthy. We frown upon that. What's interesting, I can leave here and go to like Dubai, which I've been over here many times. And Dubai is beautiful, man, right? But you walk into one of their five-star hotels and all you can smell is smoke in the, in the lobby and people walking around with pipes in there. So this here never got popular. This, these here, right here, this is, this is marijuana right here. Just so you all understand. This is vaping marijuana through pens. Um, the technology is just, it's crazy. So pod-based devices took off. Juul, the first one, made $18 billion in about three years. Where did it come from? California, not China. It came from California. This device right here was invented by two graduates from Stanford University. And they got together and changed it from free-based vaping to salt-based vaping. I don't know if you know the difference. Free-based vaping is hard to inhale, okay? It is, it's rough on the throat. And the first one had no scent, no flavor. Then these two guys said, we're going to change the game. We're going to make it really comfortable to inhale, and we're going to add flavors. Guess who was attracted to that one? The kids. So $18 billion generated in a few years by our kids in this country. And because I have such a unique job, I'm on airplane twice a week. And I land in schools like this, right? Every time I come to a school, can you please help us? What's going on? Our kids are vaping. What, and just so you understand, I've only been here a few hours. There's a bathroom right down the hall here. I walked in there today. As soon as I walked in there, what do you think I smelled? And vape, you, if, you smell, if you smell a vape, that means somebody had to be there like within the last few seconds. And I, and I, I was like kind of, I walked in there, I was shocked. And I smelled it because I know what it smells like, right? And I looked around and there was nobody in there. And, I, if I, and I, I think somebody had just went by me, but I didn't pay attention, you know what I mean? It's going on right now, right here at the school. We got kids that are hooked on this stuff, right? Nicotine through a delivery system that is way stronger than any cigarette has ever been. In fact, these are pods that come off and on. They're filled, this part right here in Juul is 41 cigarettes worth of nicotine. This is two packs of cigarettes right there. And of course we know nicotine is the chemical Right, they get you addicted. 
right? But it's what else is in there? This is this. You see, I don't want to blow this. All of these chemicals are the. We did the research and we found out that this is all the mess in a vaping device on the market today that our kids are encountering. And then we're talking about carcinogens like formaldehyde, hexanol. Is I mean, there's stuff in there. What's interesting, a lot of this stuff is the same crap that was in cigarettes, right? And they're marketing this stuff saying, oh, well, it's better for you. It's healthier, which is not true. Can you show that slide to the kids? Yes, yes, absolutely. And it blows them away. But say they think they know a lot. You know, they're like, uh. I mean, when they see that, they're like, whoa. And I don't show this one, though. This is for you. This slide right here is for parents only. Right? In plain sight. Do you know what's in your kid's backpack? Or are you a parent that says, it's none of my business. It's not, I don't go in your room. I'm not, I'm giving them privacy. Listen, first of all, it's not even their room. That's what I it's thought. Not, <laughs> <laughs> you're watching briefly. <laughs> That's right. Listen, don't get crazy with this thing. You are, you are their parent. And there's a small window here, right? That window is going to be gone quickly. When that window ends, you here's what you're doing. Tears are coming down your eyes, and you're like, "I'm so happy you got accepted. I love you." And they're going right. And I hope that when they go, that you can sleep, right? I hope that you're going to be all right. The truth of the matter is, right? If you're not up on this stuff, just don't wait until it's too late. Know what's in their backpacks. Know what's they watching. Know what they're talking about. Have a conversation with them. Quickly, this is going to go quick, so just pay attention. Oh, it's not too loud. Not as good. Thank you. 